Hello and welcome to this wonderful conversation about playwriting in Washington, D.C. I am just, again, thrilled to uh, be a part of this conversation and uh, myself, Mary Phillips, um, who will just uh, hope to share some uh, questions with you and and feel free to chime in um, wherever you feel you would like to share. So in general, your writing spans nonfiction, scholarly, and journalistic forms to more creative, performance-based works. What inspires you to move from one form to the other? It, it, it's sort of like gardening. You, Not everything is done in the same season, and uh, you have different kinds of plants that need different kinds of attention. And you can do a lot of things at, at one time if you don't try to do everything at the same time. And it gives you a break and it gives you inspiration and it uplifts you and it gives you relief to go from one thing to another, to another, to another. And it, it I find that it's uh, it's energizing overall. It sometimes exhausting, but mostly energizing to be able to uh, to step from one place to another, to uh, use another part of your brain, because you write with so many different areas of, of your your mind and heart and being and uh, that it that it um, really needs relief sometime it needs um and you get if you if you're stuck on a, on a question in one thing or on a word or on a thought or a phrase or a character moving to another platform to another kind of writing another part of your brain you answer the question you had that prompted your move in the first place so that gives you something to look forward to when you switch back to that other iteration yeah, I'd love to just build on that. Um, I think that was so eloquently explained um, and something that I very much experienced myself in my writing. Um, I'm trained formally as an academic, and so much of my work is in the scholarly tradition um, and is very focused on um, publishing for within the academy. Um, but recently, I've I've shifted um, into creative writing and am now working on writing um, television screenplays really from this indigenous feminist perspective, um, using my voice as a Chickasaw woman and drawing on my experiences um, that that transcend experiences um, that I have in the academy. Really, um, you know, when I write in my scholarly voice or for a scholarly audience or purpose, it's impossible to not bring my full self to that task. Um, but similarly, when I'm writing creatively, I also bring my full self to that task. And so in that way, um, my own experiences are, are also informed by my, my scholarly understanding of, you know, history and policy and politics. Um, and so I really see it all working together. And for me, it's impossible to separate these things. This is also part of why, um, as an academic, I've worked as an interdisciplinary thinker because, to me, um, you know, the process of siloing off or cutting off one way of thinking or knowing or being um, is in so many ways an impossible task. And so for me, also audience is a consideration. Um, I want my work to reach the broadest um, possible swath of, of viewers or readers. Um, and so for that reason, too, I also find myself working across different mediums in order in order to think differently personally, but also to reach different audiences with a similar message that always sort of revolves around um, contemporary indigenous women's experiences and what that means, um, I think in the, the political sphere. 
your play, your screenplay, Moon Time. Um, I just have a question regarding that, which is, um, you know, Moon Time examines many different facets of community and identity within professional, familial, and geographic settings. Um, why was it important to you to show these contrasting approaches? Absolutely. Um, so Moon Time is my my current screenplay that I'm working on. It's formatted as a 30 minute um, dramedy episodic television show. And the subject matter really um, is rooted in contemporary Washington, D.C. And it tells the story of um, a Native woman in her late 20s who receives an infertility diagnosis. And it explores then the ways in which that news uproots her familial relationships, her love life, and her professional development. Now, for me, it's so important to tell that story because so often we don't think about um, contemporary Indigenous people's experiences, and even less so um, the, the experiences and voices of, of women and our reproductive justice falls out of, of conversation. And so I really wanted to shine a light on these subjects. And for me, the geographic element as well, um, Washington, D.C. has been the, the perfect place to set the show. Um, I've been living and working in Washington, D.C. for several years now, and going back to my scholarship, um, almost one year ago, I published my first book, Indigenous D.C. Native Peoples in the Nation's Capital, which really paused that Washington, D.C. exists in so many ways as the political capital of Native America or the political capital of Indian country. And that's because it exists um, first and foremost as the traditional ancestral homelands of indigenous peoples, but also as this great coming together where we have a, a really diverse and really strong and th thriving urban diaspora of indigenous peoples made up of so many different tribal affiliations and cultural backgrounds, but who come to this city in order specifically to do advocacy work with the idea of working with the federal government on a government to government basis between the United States and their indigenous nation. And so, again, I really wanted to take up the perspective of one of those diasporic community members who's sort of in an urban area, existing as a contemporary Native woman, um, and, and what that experience looks like. You mentioned the Indigenous DC and, and uh, the application and book and uh, all the success of that um, that you've been working on now for a number of years. Um, but I, I do have one question um, with that. Um, did your work on indigenous DC affect how you approach depicting place in moon time in all the research that you had to do and um, then working through the, the different settings that of course in indigenous DC uh, takes you throughout DC? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so you're exactly right. The Guide to Indigenous DC mobile application, and then later the book that exists as its counterpoint, um, really walk users or readers through all these different sites of Indigenous significance. And when I, when I talk about the projects, I always make sure to emphasize that you know, the, the sites that I cover in those scholarly works are representative, but they're not exhaustive. So, you know, the two dozen or so sites that I include, um, you know, are, are places that I think people would be interested in learning about that really can shine a light on all these different facets of Indigenous community here in D.C. But I also say that really the entire swath of this territory um, could be covered in those little pinpoints that exist on the digital map. And, um, you know, 
that's because as indigenous peoples, um, you know, land is so important to us. And we know that this land is imbued with indigenous histories from long before the time that it even became the nation's capital. Um, but also there are so many of those sites that are not included that I wasn't able to include um, within the you know, the constraints of those scholarly projects. And so really I'm approaching DC rather holistically with thinking about it very much as an indigenous place in, in the context of the screenplay. So Suzanne, uh, uh, switching over to your work, um, Reclaiming One Star. Um, I, I read that you um, had a quote uh, that um, there's just something different about theater and you listen in a different way. Theater is like music. You hear it in a different part of your brain. You hear it in your heart. Um, with Reclaiming One Star, it examines the uh, case around the commander's name change and how do you see the play as contributing to that change? And what do you see as the next step in its development? Well, I've been part of the no mascot movement since um, 1962 when Clyde Warrior <laughs> came to our high school and talked to us as lowly high school seniors. And um, he was targeting what became the first mascot to be eliminated in American sports from the University of Oklahoma, Little Red. And one of the things that he said at the time that he was recruiting all of us for that effort, uh, and, and that didn't get eliminated till 1970. And then uh, big name schools, other big name schools followed. Um, and uh, to the point of um, well over uh, 1,500 to 2,000 schools um, from universities to colleges, we eliminated all of the, the community colleges uh, pejoratives. So this is something that I've been a part of uh, to one extent or another uh, uh, for a long, long time. And when we moved to uh, Washington, D.C., it was very apparent that this was football on another level. It was sports on another level. And it was just hideously vile, uh, not just the name. Uh, we, and people say, well, red is just a color. It's not the red that's really the invidious discrimination, although you wouldn't have a team called the black <laughs> or you know the black skins or the the uh, yellow skins or white skins it, it it is the skinning it's the actual um selling of um uh, of skinned people as trophies as bounties uh official acts so that's where the the name derives from is is the skinning throughout history uh, from from the earliest days of the encounters in this part of Turtle Island. The um, play that we, uh, and I, I spent some 25 years uh, litigating the issue from 1990 to uh, 2007, uh, in in three separate cases, uh, one where I was lead plaintiff, uh, uh, second one that I organized with Native young people, and a third where I was lead plaintiff again, a different theory. And um, we didn't win, but we didn't lose on the merits. And that was, we, we lost on technicalities, which was uh, quite amazing. And if anyone has ever been involved in litigation, you know that you're not in court continuously in two cases or three cases um, for for a quarter of a century without having merit to your claim. So um, once uh, we had finished that, the the a lot of the heavy lifting, and had done 
a lot of the work on Capitol Hill, getting um, all of the Democratic senators to call for a name change uh, and to uh, introduce essentially our litigation as legislation. After we had done all of that and done, we started appealing to uh, Smithsonian audiences and scholarly audiences by presenting scholarly works, community conversations, and um, case studies uh, on the subject generally. Uh, with with um, uh, the quote you read, it was actually something I said about poetry, uh, but it works with theater too. And maybe I said it about that after I said it about poetry, but it um, it does go to a different part of your of your consciousness, and it appeals to people in a different way. You can say things and and do things in a different way. Uh, you can be funny about your subject in a way that you never can be when you're in litigation, <laughs> you, you having death threats and you know all of the horrible things that happen to you when when you're part of uh, something that people uh, are are just so um, adamantly uh, possessive of, you know, their mascots are part of their lives. So um, the the idea of reclaiming one star was about the actual thievery of uh, the actual identity theft uh, that the Washington business enterprise was a part of because its first coach was a part of it. Uh, William Lone Star Dietz, he actually stole with the uh, with his uh, coaches' um, um, help. Uh, Pop Warner, the famous Pop Warner, and Richard Pratt, at Carver, the head of it, uh, actually stole the identity of of a real Native student, a Lakota student named James One Star, and. Uh, and they only only they knew that he was deceased, and because he was deceased, he um, no one would realize that this person who started writing to James One Star's sister was uh, a phony, was a absolutely not her brother. It took a court case. It took. Um, to reveal all of this, uh, um, an intensive FBI investigation uh, that that resulted in a, a, a voluminous uh, record, a court uh, case, uh, his attempts not only to steal the identity of someone, but to um, to steal the the property of the, the allotment, the annuity checks, and so on, and in, in the court. Uh, case against him for draft dodging and his excuse was I'm an I'm a non-citizen Indian which was a lie um his the sister of James one star appeared at that actual court case and uh, at the location of the court and she said why are you talking as if my you were my brother why are you writing me as if you're my brother you're not my brother why did you do that uh, it, anyway, the whole backstory is enormously uh, dramatic in and of itself, and we extended that into a modern time with descendants trying to reclaim the name of their ancestor, James One Star, and James One Star and the descendants really serving as a metaphor for the the whole of Indian country who are erased, whose true identity is erased and subjugated beneath this overlayer of stereotypes and and a pejorative um, uh, not anything as nice as a shawl that you might cover someone with a, a beautiful persona, but something uh, maybe as crusty as, as wounds uh, that they put on us and say, this is who the Native people are. So it, it's identity stealing, it's identity erasure uh, on a very broad scale. So um, 
uh, shortly after we um, we did the stage reading, which uh, I I co-wrote with with Mary Catherine Nagel, uh, the great playwright and, and attorney and screenwriter, um, and Madeline Syatt, uh of this wonderful play that I was privileged to see last night was our director. And uh, she's an educator and she's uh, a writer and, and does everything and just brilliant. And she, um, uh, and we had a great cast, West Studi and so on. Anyway, it was one of those plays that was selected uh, for the 2020 Colorado New Play um, summit and was going gangbusters and and uh uh and with the stage readings at the denver center for performing arts and then covid came and the lights went out and, <laughs> in the <laughs> on broadway and in the baseball world and i mean in the foot, basketball world first and then everything shut down uh and shortly thereafter through a convergence of reckoning and and uh uh oh uh, financial pressure the whole name of the washington team was changed and so that caused us to do rewrites which we did and workshop that at the autry and we're we're rewriting again and um uh looking for uh, another way to to look at this uh this whole phenomenon of people using other people as as mascots. Um, I mean, actual people as mascots and then caring so little about the humanity of of actual native people that they're they're willing to steal who they are, even their identity. Right. Uh, and you touched on so many important topics um, that we are have been seeing you know for uh, a few decades on the mascot issue that are now sort of changed and now you can go back and reflect on all that you've been saying for the last um, three or four decades about the the impact of Native American mascots um, and um, so you know I as many other people are would look forward very much to see um, how that is uh, written and discussed in your play. Um, and um, I, I just a follow up question to that um, is, do you, do you um, think that historical narrative play an important role in art as advocacy? Well, or, uh, I'm anxious for people to see our play too, because we, we weave in and out of the truth and things that actually uh, from audience reaction, we know that things that that sound the least believable and the most made up are the things that are the truest, the things that actually happen. Things we made up sounded like, oh, that's the fact, that's the, 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 the truth. <laughs> but we're also, um, time jumping. I mean, one of the hallmarks of, of Mary Catherine's plays uh, that that we use to full advantage in, in this uh, uh, effort of, of One Star it is time jumping so, and having characters that play other people in the... Uh, so uh, people who, who um, uh, play one character in an olden time reappear as another character but of a similar vein in in the present so um the person who played richard pratt uh, uh ended up uh, being daniel snyder for example <laughs> and then uh, uh, uh going from court case to court case and uh the uh we're looking at, at different ideas uh, I'd like to see all of the uh, the team owners uh, appear before a congressional hearing and have to raise their hands like the cigarette owners did at one point saying, no, mascots are good for you. We 
swear they are, they will make you happy. And the people who are oppressed are wrong. They're honored. <laughs> Being in D.C., you know, D.C. is the center of political activity and where policies are made that affect so many people um, in, in different ways, um, especially in the art world. Uh, um, if I can ask, are there ways you feel art can impact conversations around policy and understanding that other forms cannot? I, I think it's a great question, Mary. Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, like we've already gestured to in our conversation here today, um, I, I think absolutely art holds the potential to shape um, outcomes in the policy and political arenas. I think it also has the ability to shape public perception, um, which in turn can reverberate throughout societal attitudes and perhaps manifest um, in you know, collective action um, or organizing around a particular subject. You know, as I think about my work um, sort of spanning between the scholarly world and um, more public and creative forms of writing, you know, one of the things that I, I constantly think about are these studies that have been done, um, you know, through, through research methods that show the ways in which misperceptions, um, misconceptions about Indigenous peoples and misinformation um, really then yields concrete material outcomes that shape the daily lived experiences um, for our communities. And so, you know, for me, the thread tying then the artistic and creative uh, works with the scholarly research agenda is this idea that, um, first of all, all of it contributes toward this larger goal of, I think, elevating the needs and priority issues of our communities and serving that um, through a variety of different mechanisms. Um, but then secondarily, you know, also raising the profile of of our communities, giving a voice to the issues that we're dealing with and experiencing, sharing that um, not only critically internally uh, amongst ourselves, but also with people who are non-Indigenous, our non-Indigenous neighbors, who have the ability to be allies, to exist in solidarity. Um, and I think, again, in Washington, DC, we see that so clearly where we have, you know, a makeup of Indigenous peoples coming from tremendously diverse backgrounds, but who oftentimes come together around shared causes in order to present those issues before Congress or before the president or before the Department of the Interior, whatever it may be. Um, and so for me, I absolutely see, you know, this thread between scholarship, creative work and art and politics working collectively together um, for the benefit of Indian country here in DC. I used to be executive director of the National Congress of American Indians. And we tried as an organization, as, as representing native nations across the country, we tried everything we could to stop a lot of things that were happening on Capitol Hill that were anti-native and that um and to get our positive agenda through and um our the bad things that were happening were uh, the federal Indian budget was being cut by one third every year by um uh, the or proposed to be cut and and that went by the Reagan administration the first six years of the Reagan administration, and we had to fight like heck to stop that from happening. Uh, but it was my considered strategy that we had to move towards something. And I'd been working for a long time toward um, a, a museum of the American Indian that was uh, national, um, started as a cultural center idea, but one that that would was always intended to be placed in Washington, right at the foot of the Capitol, 
right facing the Capitol. So the people in the Capitol would have to look us in the face when they made policies about us. And that was before I knew what any of that meant in DC terms. Um, that was uh, what was in my mind, you know, long before that, uh, before I moved here actually. And I never thought I would live in Washington because it's a whole other planet from Oklahoma. It's a whole other planet from New York and so on. In, do, in pushing for the National Museum of the American Indian and for repatriation, um, it, we had a different language that we used because there were tribal languages. There um there were and and pushing for the uh, Native American Languages Act and all of the the, the great pieces of of uh, policy that were gotten in in the eighties, we um, were able to do both things. We were able to defeat the bad stuff and and get done the good stuff because we knew how to adjust and how how to adjust our our ideas and our ways of expressing and presenting them, uh, depending on the topic and the urgency of it, or the topic and and our best case examples, and at the same time, our our staff needed to, uh, and and our best tribal advocates needed some rest because it was hard hard work, exhausting work those years, and. So we also did something that was the, called the Average Savage Review, which um, it was was just something that took uh, that rewrote uh, commonly known songs and um, uh, rewarded the uh, the good and the bad <laughs> who got their just desserts in in the modern era not in the past tense, but what was happening right now. And one thing you, you learn in, in working in different kinds of arts, and one thing I've learned in doing uh, exhibits and, and um, working in theater and, and for a long time, and is, is you have people who, who are visual people, people who uh, like to read labels, people who hate labels and only want to look, people who will be voracious readers of every bit of material you you provide them um who who want more and more of that and others who uh, they just want the feel the gist of it so they'll listen to a cultural interpreter or a guide more than they will actually read what you've written or they will actually see what you think you have have put in front of them. Um, so it, it, because there, people have so many ways, not just of being in the world, but ways of perceiving the world and ways of understanding the world, ways of being able to take it in, um, something like the average savage review really appealed to a lot of people because with one rewritten song, you could do more damage. <laughs> Or get you could persuade more members of Congress to, uh, who would come to our annual uh, congressional awards uh, banquet and, and be um, subjected to this this uh, song and dance routine um, by native native uh, staff people who were policy people and they knew all of us in one setting and and we were in a different. Uh, uh, we were different creatures when we did the average savage review. <laughs> so uh, that kind of um, interplay is so important in the successful grappling with that those policies that make all the difference in the world to Native peoples uh, that are made right here in, in Washington, D.C. And that's... Um, that's the reason a lot of people stay. I stayed um, first because my husband died and I was a single mother and with two kids and I needed a job. You know, I was working and um, I, I needed to keep working. 
and the, so I I kind of got stuck here, but I also um, I also love the work and the outcome of all of the different kinds of work I was doing and the way that it felt just so wonderful to be able to succeed with either bare education or movement to action or appeal to the, um, I mean, everyone loves a good revolution in some sense of the word or some uh, area of life. And uh, we appeal to a lot of people who were old museum people just because they were tired of the same old museum, for example. Uh, and we we uh, had our greatest opponents from that same world um, because they hated the idea of change. So it, when, you, when you're working with diametrically opposed audiences, uh, you have to set the tone for what what you're doing and and how you're going to appeal to them or decide that you're only going to arm up the people who will who you who you who are persuadable uh for on the merits on the issues on the idea on the compassion on the love uh, any way that you can you can uh, um navigate these these often choppy waters in the swamp. Okay, well, thank you so much um, for these um, this time and and um, taking this moment to, you know, give us um, a little bit of yourselves today and in the way that you have expressed through the various art forms um, in poetry and playwriting in screenwriting. Um, and I I just want to end today with asking either of you if, if there are um, any current projects that you'd like to share um, with folks and um, any other words on our conversation today. Something I'm working on right now is of course, continuing to write Moon Time um, with the goal of, of having it produced. Um, I'm also working on uh, my second book, scholarly book, um, which takes up many of the same topics at the heart of Moon Time. Um, so the second book looks at reproductive justice as a critical factor in understanding um, the disproportionate violence leading to our, our current issue with missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and uh, those are those are two of the projects that I'm heavily engaged in right now, two different, but as I hope you have gotten a sense of very connected um, and and interrelated projects. Oh, my. Well, it, I'll be a commercial for an exhibit that I curated in uh, a book that I edited, both titled Nation to Nation Treaties. Uh, between the United States and American Indian Nations, which is at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian, opened in uh, 2014, and will the exhibition will go on until 2027. So you don't have to rush right out, but uh, you might want to. It, it's a pretty good exhibit. And th something that's my most recent poem, which is about to be published, um, that is, we've already um, approved the broadside, is for a project with uh, a conceptual arts project that uh, was conceived by, by uh, a conceptual artist, John Rubin, at Carnegie Mellon. And they got a, an abandoned um, warehouse in, in uh, a, a building in Pittsburgh. And invited conceptual visual artists to name a museum uh, every month. You know, one one artist will name a museum and to invite a writer to write something in any form that would be published as a broadside. So paint, Painter comes in and does the banner of this museum. Um, and the first one is, is uh, I've forgotten the exact title but 
something quite wonderful like um, uh, the Museum of Nostalgia for the time in which we live, which is <laughs> really interesting. And um, I can't wait to read what was, was written about that. And uh, Edgar Heap of Birds, who also is Cheyenne, and um, he uh, and and uh, was the the conceptual artist who invited me to write something, and he named the the um, uh, the museum uh, the Museum of Broken Treaties. So I decided to write a poem about that. And um, and it's soon to be published on this broadside, <laughs> and, uh, well. distributed freely. So uh, get them while they last, and um, uh, they can be found on online either under John Rubin's name or under uh, the museum, the the national the National Museum Project. So um, those are two things that I'm very excited about. Well, that's so wonderful. And we all look forward to both of your upcoming projects. And um, just once again, thank you so much for sharing today. And we are going to sign off um, and uh, we'll hope to see you uh, very soon. Signing off from DC. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>